My name is Marco Di Benedetto and uh, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Embrain. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, Embrain as well as some context around where we, where we apply our, our solution. Uh, Embrain was founded in 2009. As you can see from the slide, uh, they, they, we're backed by tier one investors that include uh, Lightspeed, uh, Northbridge and NEA. We've been receiving awards from uh, magazines, analysts, which are very welcome. I mean, we're, we're working hard to try to get, uh, uh, to, to help the data center evolve into the next generation. And so that's always welcoming. But the more important aspect is the fact that we're getting production customers right now that are helping us uh, refine and tune our solution, mostly from an operational perspective. Obviously, it's, it's relatively easy to build a solution with the, with the technology in mind and thinking how the technology can change the world, but then try to operationalize that technology and making sure that the technology can be consumed by people today without having to wait for 20 more transitions in IT is probably the big challenge. And so having these production customers is keeping us grounded and making sure that we can uh, deliver to that, to that promise. In terms of uh, what we deliver specifically, we are a layer for seven company. We deliver uh, layer for seven services uh, for uh, software-defined software -defined network services for the Azure data center. And that includes uh, load balancers, firewalls, VPN, services that you're familiar with. We're not uh, uh, delivering any new layer for seven services, but we're enabling the, uh, the ability to take these services and combine them together in more, uh, in more productive, more efficient ways with uh, what we call V topologies, virtual topologies that allow you to create uh, uh, layer three networks, if you will, that connect all these services together, do service chaining, allow service insertion for uh, different services at different times. And with the focus on applications, with the focus on software-defined uh, data centers, applied to both service providers as well as enterprises. Clearly, there's a, there's a good uh, match between our solution and service providers, especially on the uh, cloud side, but as well as on the managed hosting side. And uh, typically, one of the, uh, the best-selling use cases on the service provider side for us is the ability to merge uh, the two environments. If a customer goes to a service provider that offers both cloud as well as managed hosting, a customer might want to have uh, bo access to both environment, a footprint in both environment, and being able to work on both environments as if they were a single uh, a single place. So building this seamless integration between phys physically different environments within uh, a service provider um, uh, space is a critical win for us. On the enterprise side, uh, the focus is uh, on IT automation. And so we'll see in, uh, in the next uh, few slides how we are looking at the operational aspects of uh, uh, enabling a layer for seven services, agile layer for seven services in a traditional environment. And so in, uh, when we're talking about IT automation, we're referring specifically to networking automation within IT and not necessarily a broader picture of automation in, in, uh, across the entire data center. Um, but so it, starting with uh, the, uh, the software defined data center, our, we think that software defined data centers should be focused not on the infrastructure itself, but on delivering applications. And so making sure that you end up with uh, a number of applications that are manageable, that are maintainable, is the critical win of software defined anything. So software defined data center being the, co the combination of all these software defined pieces that are enabling applications. So the goal is to be able to take all the elements of IT and allow them to offer resources to application developers, to application managers, so that uh, these applications can be delivered, can be moved, can be uh, grown, shrunk, can be moved around, uh, uh, brokered, if you will, in different locations. Not necessarily stuff that we all can do today, but in terms of, of, of the vision, the vision is for applications to be standalone components that can be taken, replicated, moved around at will. And obviously, one of the uh, foundations to enable that is the ability to have uh, automation around the physical infrastructure and automation around the presentation of this physical infrastructure in software terms. If you don't have that, what happens? I mean, we've been focusing mostly on uh, networking. And what we're seeing talking to customers was that if you don't have uh, automation on the networking IT side, what ends up happening is that uh, the, uh, your, your application developers get frustrated. You start having shadow versions of IT, the typical the traditional uh, desktop under the desk of somebody that is uh, hosting critical information while instead it shouldn't be used at all, uh, that is bypassing all the best practices from an IT perspective, all the business processes from an IT perspective, or even worse, possibly, the, the people that are taking all their, their code and their applications and moving them to the public cloud because they're getting the, the, the resources they need in the time that they, they, they need. 
or at least they think they're getting the resources they need. They obviously don't pay too much attention to the, uh, to, to the mandates that IT has because they are outside of that, of that environment. They're building applications. They just want to have uh, the resources available. Availability might not be as big a concern and control of information, protection of information, security might also not be as big a concern for the application developer, but it's definitely the bread and butter of people that are working in IT. So losing control of these applications, losing control of these pieces, allowing these pieces to be in environments that are not protected by, uh, by, the, by the business practices of IT is a concern. But that's what's going to happen if you don't have the ability to deliver things at the same speed at which they can, they can receive them uh, on the public cloud. If you will, I mean, in, in my mind, the public cloud has enabled some awareness of the speed at which things can be done. And now the challenge for IT is to catch up with that, uh, with that awareness and make sure that the same type of speeds can be offered uh, within IT. And Embrain does its piece offering the type of agility within, uh, within networking. So our goal is to enable the maximum flexibility possible in delivering new, new devices, new resources from an IT perspective. Now, in, to put this more into, into a context, I think I'm using, I, I like to use this slide where we're talking about different silos and uh, it's gonna be clear why why I'm still talking about silos and why I'm not talking about full convergence and a single team where everybody loves each other. But we'll talk about that in a minute. First, I want to I wanna identify a, a number of components inside the data center that are part of, uh, that, that have to be part of what becomes a software-defined data center. So the first component is compute. And when you're looking at compute, uh, it's probably clearer if we replace the words raw and provision with the words physical and virtual. People talk about virtualization a lot. And so in the context of virtualization, you're taking, you're taking physical resources, putting an hypervisor on it. That resource with the hypervisor is something that is invisible to everybody, and everybody consumes provision resources, consumes virtual machines on top of that uh, physical infrastructure. The function that enables you to use uh, virtual machines within a physical environment that has uh, the ability to, to be virtualized is what we call here the function of virtualization and provisioning. We're using the term provisioning in, in ways that might not be super familiar to people, but for us provisioning is the ability to take resources that are raw and transform it into resources that can be consumed uh, by, uh, by the final user of, uh, the, of the IT infrastructure. And so this model can be replicated uh, in all the different environments, right? You can, you can replicate the same model on the storage side, where now we're talking about JBODs on the physical side and volume management or any form of virtualization on top uh, when the resources are getting provisioned. Uh, you can talk about that on the networking side now at layer two, which is not uh, a focus that Embrain has. A, the majority of the, of, of the excitement that came about in the last few years around networking has been in this, in, in this uh, pillar. So we've been looking at a lot of uh, enhancements, a lot of improvements around taking physical layer two subnets, layer two broadcast domains, and transforming th those physical resources into virtual components that can be consumed in a much more granular way with a lot more automation with uh, much more scalability, scalability around that. But layer two is not the end game, right? Layer two gives you subnets. And the communication within the subnets maintains all the properties that you need for broadcast domains, the ability to send the broadcast multicast packets. Everything is great, but at the end of the day, you want packets to get out of the subnets, and so you need also uh, the same type of capabilities at layer three and above, and layer four, seven as well. So the, uh, the, the resources that you're using might be different. On, uh, on the network connectivity side, you're, you're virtualizing switches, or if you're working more on the hypervisor side, you're still leveraging um, resources that are on the compute side. But on the network services side, uh, clearly the goal is to take uh, physical resources that, that used to be appliances, but now an appliance, everybody knows, is nothing more than a uh, physical server with a special label on top of it. I mean, the majority of the layer for seven appliances especially don't have a lot of intellectual properties uh, built into ASICs. So they're taking off the shelf components and packaging these off the shelf components into servers. They call them appliances, they have the label of the, the vendor that delivers the service, uh, but at the end of the day, they are, they are more general purpose that they, that they look uh, on, the, on the front. And so you take these resources, and you, when you want to deliver a software version of these uh, appliances, the first insight is that uh, uh, layer 4.7 services are all end systems. 
So from a networking perspective, they're not participating into the core of the network. They are kind of there, but they are somewhat on the side because from a, from a, from a network stack perspective, they are consuming uh, flows, they are consuming the, the resources all the way, potentially at layer seven, all the way to understanding the entire application stack and then proxying that back into, into whatever uh, rest of the infrastructure that is needed. So because network services are end systems, the raw, in, the raw infrastructure that is used for network services is the same raw infrastructure that is used for compute. Now, it could be the same infrastructure, it could be different. I'm showing here a logical separation, mostly because uh, if you look at this slide, the way it's built so far, there's a clear uh, a mapping between these silos and the different IT organizations, especially when an IT infrastructure is large. There's going to be different teams that are responsible for the different pieces. And so if you start merging the physical components at the bottom, you might have an inability to maintain control over those physical resources. And the fact that you're doing virtualization and provisioning, and that means you're, you're offering these virtual resources and these software-defined data center components, to, uh, to the application developers does not mean you're losing control, of, uh, you're losing visibility of the physical infrastructure. One critical element of any good virtualization and provisioning function is the ability to maintain that control, to enable service level agreements for the resources, that are, for the physical resources, so that when you consume the provision resources, you can get a certain amount of capacity, certain amount of speed, certain amount of performance, depending on um, the requirements of the application. So now on top of that, uh, the last element of this picture is uh, an element of orchestration. Orchestration has by definition to go across multiple silos. And that's where things start getting a bit complicated from an operational perspective because once you have an element that spans across, now your teams have to, have to work together. And so if this is a software-defined data center, if these are the building blocks of a software-defined data center, now are we saying that in order to be able to take advantage of all the software-defined co components that are coming up lately, we need to have done all of this? Or can we take a single piece in isolation and take advantage and, and, and uh, leverage the benefits of, uh, of virtualization and uh, software-defined uh, components only by looking individually at each one of the components? And what Embrain believes is that uh, uh, when you want to talk about operational convergence, it's great to think about a goal of converging IT because without convergence, you're going to have uh, higher OPEX, you're going to have more costs. Teams that don't talk to each other are going to create more complexity in managing uh, very basic processes. But on the other hand, the technology is not going to make uh, a change in business process. You're not going to buy, if, if you're managing IT, you're not going to buy from a company a, a good a good love between your IT teams and better, better communication across functional teams. That is something that you have to work with within your business processes. And technology can help you, but it can only get you so far. If you want to get to full convergence, it's work that needs to be done on, on your organizational side and that technology cannot take care of. So now if people come in and say, well, in order to use our product, you need to have as, as a requirement cross-functional teams and convergence of IT, then it's, that puts a break on the, on the whole conversation because you're going to need to work on that first. You cannot throw in a product and then expect that convergence is just going to happen because things are going to just go wrong if people don't have the right resources available. So if you're not there, if you don't have uh, convergence, which is a good goal, but uh, from my conversations with people, it's something that is very seldom uh, achieved within the companies that we talk to. If you don't have that, what can you do? And so now this is where we start looking at uh, uh, different solutions and classifying these different solutions in terms of solutions that are hypervisor centric versus solutions that are network centric. The, the focus for me here is on the networking side, obviously, because uh, the, the, that's the focus that Embrain has in delivering layer four seven services. But even in this space, there's the, there's the possibility to choose different models. And you might uh, probably, what, you, what, you, what you're used to on the software-defined side are models that are hypervisor-centric, are models that uh, have a large investment on the virtual switching component within the hypervisor to enable 
uh, the, the flexibility that is, uh, that is visible, that, that is presented at a high level. That, that presentation of a very flexible and agile environment is built around the cornerstone of a virtual switch, which technically is a piece of the hypervisor. And that's what we call a hypervisor-centric approach, where you're going to have uh, to have a single hypervisor that is going to host both the compute silo as well as the network silo. And now the management of that hypervisor becomes the bottleneck, becomes the, the point of contentions between uh, the, the um, the compute team and the, and the network team. So if, you have, if you're choosing hypervisor-centric approach, probably convergence is required. If you don't want to have convergence of IT or you cannot afford to have convergence of IT, then the end result is that you're naturally or naturally you're going to start shifting some of the budget to the, to the single team that is going to be able to manage the hypervisor and therefore is going to be uh, responsible to manage the compute and the networking both. So typically, the systems teams will become we, we start owning more of the networking, uh, more of the networking responsibilities, and that's not necessarily a win of the systems teams, right? Most many people depict the systems and the network team as fighting for turf and trying to get uh, the best uh, the, the best amount of resources for themselves. Well, it turns out that nobody wants more responsibilities actually. So the systems teams that owns the network has the responsibility to make the network work. It doesn't have the skills to make the network work. It doesn't understand how the network works. And the expectation that the hypervisor-centric approach is going to be able to hide all that complexity and to control everything without needing that expertise is probably uh, something that still needs to be proven. The alternative for us is to look at network-centric approaches. A network-centric approach is an approach where the team that manages the specific function within IT, the networking team, has controlled the resources for, for the networking all the way to the bottom. So you organize, so you're taking physical appliances that were doing load balancing, firewalling, VPNs, you're replacing those, those functions with physical servers. Those servers are owned by the networking team. It's a very strong statement, but remember, the cross-functional team requirement is something that you might not have. If you have cross-functional teams, you don't have to separate the resources. You can live with a single environment uh, shared by uh, networking as well as systems. But if you don't have convergence yet, then uh, it, it is much better for you to, be, to have a choice to say, well, I'm going to give you networking guys uh, a set of physical resources. You're going to run your stuff here. You're managing the password of this hypervisor or these resources. And once you've done, once you've done that, uh, you, can, you, don't, you have the responsibility to continue to maintain the network. You don't have any excuses to say this is not working because these other guys are doing, uh, are doing something to my, to my environment. And so think about some of, the, some of the virtualization options that exist today that are on the network-centric side. Think about uh, uh, products that might have uh, a hypervisor that is hidden within, uh, within an appliance. Nobody knows that there's a hypervisor there because the, the, the APIs of the hypervisor are not directly exposed but you end up with uh, partitions of that uh, physical appliance as virtual appliances. What Embrain does is we take that model and we convert that model into an open model where the servers are uh, general purpose servers uh, as, as a first step. Uh, the hypervisor is a general purpose hypervisor. You can run VM, you can run uh, uh, Zen, you can run KVM. And, uh, the, uh, and on top of that, we enable a, a component of automation that allows the creation and the abstraction of these uh, physical resources so that the network team does not have to have ex expertise on the hypervisor side. It only needs to maintain the expertise on the network side. And it, and it continues to control the same type of resources that it was controlling before. If you're used to a lights out data center, you're not going to see any difference between an environment that is built uh, in a software-defined way with uh, Embrain resources versus a physical environment that is built with physical appliances. You're not going to see any difference because the resources, once they are provisioned, the resources look exactly the same, behave exactly the same, and the best practices and designs remain the same. So that's the starting point. Um, and so once you have uh, um, that, that means you don't have to do all or nothing. And so this is where we want to make an example of one of our production customers where they didn't have the ability to, uh, to take everything and converge everything together and uh, deliver a single optimal software-defined experience for all the contingencies, the contingencies within, within IT. All they needed was IT automation, firewall automation, because they had a very clear pain point around 
their customers coming in and requiring more isolated applications. And in order to get to that isolation, what they needed was networking, uh, better networking capabilities. So we deliver that to them. We offer them the ability to create these firewalls on a per dedicated on a per customer basis so that the policies that the customers required could be offered to the customers and delegated to the customer itself that could manage their own resources. The physical resources were shared, but the experience was the experience of a dedicated pool of appliances that every customer could use. And when the, when the customer, the, the contract with the customer expired, it was very easy to remove these resources and it, there was no requirement to, um, to take this uh, uh, this uh, to, to, to take uh, some shared device and taking rules within those shared devices and uh, pushing pushing them out which if you have a shared device with with a firewall that has shared rules then you end up with uh, a very complex management uh, approaches to try to mitigate failures when you want to remove a rule that seems to, to apply only to one user but effectively might apply to more and so you create a security a security problem there so as I was describing our solution is all software based. This is another view of the slide that we had earlier. And uh, so that's, I think we're, we're running out of time now. Minute. One minute, wow. Minute. So sorry, I've been talking too much about silos, but I think it's, it's very critical to look into that. I mean, this is my last slide, so that doesn't, it, it doesn't impact this presentation, but I think it's very critical to look at, uh, to look at the, that operational aspect because you want to make sure that whatever you start doing for, to get to a software defined data center, to get to the vision of, uh, being able to take individual applications and run each applications independently so that you can start brokering the applications around because all the resources that belong to the application are contained within the application. And there's nothing that is extraneous that sits somewhere else that is going to be potentially impacting the application when you move it around. This vision can only be delivered if you start baby steps with something that, has, uh, that allows you to have that control on the networking side. That's all. Thank you. The, the police here is coming. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I, actually, I have a, I have a question. So, uh, um, so you know, I, and I appreciate the case study up there. You know, what I'd like to, one of the things that I didn't take away from the slide and that I'd love to understand about the use case is, what was the exact problem that they were having with their firewall VPN infrastructure as it was, you know, before they went to a software-defined model with Embrain? You know, what was it with the, what is the issues that they had that said, hey, we have to change it and it's broken, it needs to be fixed? Yeah, so, th th probably the, the, main, the main issue was an issue of control. Uh, the, when you have, uh, normally when you're looking at, especially, and especially on the VPN, this is more true on the VPN side than it is on the firewall side. If you look at firewall products, they all have uh, the ability to build context or virtual context or virtual systems within a physical firewall. And so to get uh, to a certain level of isolation, at least at the presentation layer, you could just offer a context to every customer. Most vendors don't offer a VPN, a IPsec VPN, when, when the contexts are enabled. And so at that point, if you wanted to have a VPN capability for all your customers, that was a no-go. But also, uh, the, the, it's the, the ability to create uh, service level agreements for different customers and offer a different amount of resources for the different partitions was, was problematic. Because as I, I, was, I used the word presentation layer sp specifically because when you're looking at virtual context, it's a management construct. It's not a data path construct. So if you want to have a, a, a complete data path isolation, then you need to have a different model where virtualization, uh, the virtual machines model is a good model to enable that. All right, excellent, thank you. Right. Matter of fact, you scared me to death because when, the minute you said Vsys, I'm an old net screen guy, so <laughs> anybody who has the net screens v and remember the old Vsys, you could probably cringe like I do. Oh, yeah, I see the head nodding. So, uh, yeah, real quick, one question. Okay, uh, commenting question, comment, Conway's law applies, you, you sort of hinted at it, but, uh, you did, but, but it's important. Secondly, you punted on the, on the orchestration question. Right. You, know, you had this big old slide of orchestration, then you just sort of went straight on up, up the human organization. The concern I have, the question I have is, orchestration, even defined by somebody else, like OpenStack or CloudStack or whatever, creates a whole set of abstractions. That, that, that the abstractions are defined by the orchestration, not by you. How do you, how do you, how do you reconcile the, you know, the, the potential mismatch between the orchestration and abstractions and the services you're providing? Uh, so the question is, how do you, how do you reconcile the, 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 the potential mismatch that exists when you have an orchestration layer, the orchestration is abstracting resources and is presenting certain, um, certain metaphors. 
how do you al allow that metaphor to map into physical resources or to virtual resources that are built underneath? Well, the, the, the orchestration, I punted on the orchestration question specifically because we don't deal with the orchestration. What we do is we offer northbound APIs, and so our system is completely API based. Actually, the only native access to the product is uh, a REST API. The assumption is that uh, the, when an orchestration system exists, the orchestration system is responsible to create that metaphor, to create that abstraction. We are behaving like traditional appliances, and so in that sense, it's easier to insert uh, our model within an orchestration model because orchestration has been designed with the uh, existing uh, appliances in mind. They, they've been having trouble. I mean, I think uh, orchestration is something that, is, that, that can only be delivered where, when the, un the elements underneath are orchestratable. And uh, when we started the company, actually there was the insight that we, we started with, that we didn't think that any of the networking products that, were, that existed at the time were orchestratable. And so if uh, the property is missing from an element, then the orchestration tool is going to fail because it's not going to be able to deliver. Instead, we built a model where instead that orchestratability is a property that we offer, and therefore we think that orchestration is going to be possible starting from that. <laughs>